Okay, so now we prove that a self adjoint operator T on a finite dimensional inner product space has an eigenvalue. So self adjoint is an important assumption here because we know that on real vector spaces some operators do not have an eigenvalues. Um, as a remark, it's interesting to note that eigenvalue is just a property of the operator and the vector space. You don't need an inner product there for, the, for it to have an eigenvalue or for V to be an eigenvalue or for an eigenvector or for lambda to be an eigenvalue. But if for some inner product the operator is self-adjoint, then this result works and we can show this using the previous lemma. The proof is, proof is kind of magic and so beautiful that I decided to present it myself. So the proof is as follows. It's a similar trick to one of the most beautiful proofs we saw last semester in Nono's Linear Algebra 1. Right. So let n denote the dimension of this inner product space, which we are assuming is finite. And as we know, the dimension of the space of linear maps from v to v will be equal to n times n, because it's from v to v, so it's n times n. So this is n squared is the dimension of this space. So the space of linear operators on V, it also, it's also finite dimensional. Okay? N squared, it doesn't really matter what value is. What matters is it's finite dimensional. So now we consider a family of operators on this space, which has just one vector too many. Okay? The identity, T, T composed with itself, which we denote as T squared, t composed with t squared, which we denote as t cubed, and so on, pa, 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 up to t n squared. So since identity is t to the zero, identity is the same as t to the zero, so here there are n squared plus one linear operators on v. So it's just too many, because we can't have more than n squared of them being linearly independent. We know this is a basic property from uh, vector spaces, except that now my vector space is not V anymore, it's the space of operators on V. So this has to be linearly dependent. There's just too many vectors here. There's one too many, in fact. So since it has n squared plus one elements, it has to be linearly dependent, which is just what I just said in this space, the space of linear operators. And therefore, there exists a non-trivial linear combination of these operators that give the zero linear operator as a result. Non-trivial means one of these numbers is not zero. And now what we do is we forget about linear operators and just look at these numbers. Just look at these numbers and let's use these numbers to build a polynomial. Okay, here's my polynomial. I'll build this polynomial. It looks very similar to this, but this is just a polynomial. I'm just putting these numbers here and writing t, t, t squared, t cubed, pa, 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 up to t to the n squared. Okay. I'm, I'm building this polynomial. I'm defining this. This is just a polynomial with degree at most n squared. Okay. It doesn't have to be t squared, in fact, uh, n squared. Okay, so, and, and these are just numbers, these coefficients. So, at this point, let us make a choice. Let's choose our field of numbers to be the field of real numbers. So, it will be the field of real numbers. And so, all these coefficients are real. And then we want to apply the fundamental theorem of algebra. Problem is, fundamental theorem of algebra does not apply for reals. It applies for complex polynomials. But, well, it, and also using some properties of conjugate, which I'm going to omit the tedious details, this polynomial we can be factorized as follows. There is some constant. This constant is not zero and it's real, because if we take the conjugate of this entire polynomial here, it has to be the same. Why? Because this polynomial is all real. So the C has to be real and it cannot be zero. And here are the factors t minus one root, t minus another root, t minus another root, t minus another root, except that I'm grouping, I'm grouping 
the real roots here in the end and I'm grouping the non-real roots with their conjugate pair even if they're, they're repeated roots the number of pairs is the same they have they come the conjugate comes with the same multiplicity so I'm grouping them here I'm putting one non-real root with its conjugate another one with its conjugate and so on pa -pa -pa -pa, up to the last one with its conjugate and now one key observation, one central observation here in this proof is when we have t minus a complex number times t minus <coughs> the conjugate of that complex number, what we get is some t squared minus 2bt plus c and this is an irreducible factor. Irreducible because exactly because this polynomial does not have real roots. That's exactly the reason. You need to think about it for a while. If it's not obvious at this point, you can do some pause and think about it. If this if this is the polynomial you, you get from non-real complex number and its conjugate like this, then this will necessarily be a polynomial that has no real roots, which means exactly in the sense we have been talking before, an irreducible factor. Okay? So writing these two as q0 and these two as qm and the ones in the middle also here in the middle, each one of these is an irreducible factor. Okay? So this is the key observation. We observe that each of these expressions here are irreducible factors. And now by the previous lemma that we have proved, if we now put t here, the capital T, the operator we have, not little t as just a variable anymore, we put the capital T here, we have proved that under the assumption that t is self-adjoint, under this assumption, we, can, we have proved that this is invertible. This is invertible. These are all invertible vectors. Okay. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, what do we know? We know that P of T, now I'm putting capital T here, capital T here, capital T here, we know that this is zero. And since P can be written like this and can be written like this, it also means that this operator here is zero. Okay, this operator here is zero. Um, we don't really need it to be zero. Being zero is overkilling here. What we need is just that it's not invertible. But of course, zero is not invertible. So this composition here is not invertible. But this part we know is invertible. This part is invertible. This part is invertible. This part is just a number. How can it be? How can the result of all these composing all these operators be not invertible? Well, the only way for, for this to happen is that one of these factors, one of these factors here where lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda k are real roots. We didn't, we didn't even know it had a real root beforehand, but now it must have one because it must be one of these factors that is not invertible. Because one of these factors will be responsible for this whole composition here to be not invertible. And, well, we know t minus lambda j i not being vertible means it's not injective and it's not surjective either. These are all equivalent when the vector space is finite dimensional. And that means lambda j is an eigenvalue. So we have, the proof is finished. We have proved that, let's go up here, up, up, up. We have proved that operator t self of a joint operator T on finite dimension in a product space has an eigenvalue. Well, at some point in the middle of the proof, we assumed the field is the field of real numbers. What happens if instead it is the complex number? Well, we have already done that in Nono's linear algebra one. This case is actually simpler. We don't even need to use this assumption. We had, we had to use this assumption here to use the lemma to say that these are invertible because we have these terms here which were disturbing 
Well, in the complex case, we don't even need to worry about it. In the complex case, we don't have these terms. In, com in the complex case, we can look at this form here, and that's enough. It's completely factorized, and if p of t is zero, it's not invertible, it must be one of these not to be zero. Some of you will probably remember this proof from last semester. It was towards the end of the course and it's also in Linear Algebra Done Right book. That's a very beautiful proof. I hope you have enjoyed it. Please, if there is any part which is not so clear, leave your questions.